Instead of good morning, how about good afternoon? Welcome. Um, I thought a little history or trivia might be in order to, to start the day, and since we, have, we are at Ford Field, this might be uh, very appropriate. On July 23rd, 1903, the Ford Motor Company sold its first automobile. So we'll start the day with that. And on behalf of our member institutions and the conference, Thank you for your attendance and let me express how good it is to once again be talking about football. I'd like to welcome the new members of the media who are with us, as well as a group of social media members who were selected to come and participate in today's events. And I hope you have a memorable and productive afternoon. The conference welcomes four new head coaches this season. Dino Babers at Bowling Green, Chris Creighton at Eastern Michigan, Chuck Martin at Miami, and Mark Whipple at Massachusetts. I'd like to acknowledge the bowl representatives that are with us today. First from our five primary bowl partners, Chris Pica from the Bahamas Bowl, Doug Mosley from the Boca Raton Bowl, Kevin McDonald from the famous Idaho Potato Bowl, Jerry Silverstein, the GoDaddy Bowl, and Johnny Williams from the Raycom Media Camellia Bowl. And from the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, Gary Stoken from the college football playoff, Reed Sigmund. Hope you have the chance to visit with them a little later this afternoon. Where are the SIDs from our member institutions? Can you raise your hand when you're out there? And they're in the back and around. And, and mainly I wanted to say thank you for your efforts with today's events and what you do throughout the year. I appreciate what you do for the student athletes and for the coaches, for the institutions and the conference. Thank you on that. And if you missed it yesterday, the Mid-American Conference hosted its fourth annual youth football clinic. We had over 400 Detroit area youth with us. We've grown that event from just over 100 kids the first year, and none of this would be possible without our partnership with Tom Lawand and Ford Field, the Detroit Police Athletic League, and the participation of our coaches, head coaches, our assistant coaches, and the student athletes. So thank you to all who are involved. And as I look back, on the last year, there are a number of highlights that I would point to. Once again, we were in the hunt for a BCS bowl berth. The MAC had three teams with 10 or more wins, and only the SEC and Pac-12 had more. NIU had an undefeated season, regular season, was ranked as high as 14th in the nation, and became the first MAC team to defeat two Big Ten teams in a season. Bowling Green won its first conference football title, since back-to-back -back titles in 91 and 92. NIU's Jordan Lynch finished third in voting for the Heisman Trophy. And Buffalo's Khalil Mack won the Jack Lambert Award and was the fifth overall selection in the NFL draft. NIU's Jimmy Ward was also drafted in the first round. In indoor track, Akron sophomore Sean Barber became the institution's first male individual national champion by winning the NCAA indoor pole vault. In wrestling, a record 43 MAC wrestlers earned a berth to the NCAA championships, and Chu freshman Jaden Cox from affiliate member Missouri won a national title at 197 pounds. Nine wrestlers earned All-America honors. In basketball, both the men's and women's programs attained league RPIs of 12, reflecting improved quality and depth. And on the men's side, six teams were ranked in the top 100 as we entered our conference tournament last season. In outdoor track, Akron's Anika Roloff won the NCAA women's pole vault title, and Akron almost pulled off the double when Sean Barber, who won the, out the indoor title, came in second. And Kent State's Matthias Teela won the NCAA championship in the hammer throw. Safety in college football remains a front burner issue. Last year, led by the College Football Officiating Board of Managers, the NCAA instituted a rule for targeting. Hitting a defenseless player in the head or neck area or leading with the crown of the helmet resulted in a 15-yard penalty, an automatic disqualification from the game, and a suspension of one half. The rule has helped change the behaviors of the players. We witnessed fewer and fewer high hits last year and saw players lowering their contact point or even pulling up to avoid an unnecessary hit and risk a disqualification. In games involving the Mid-American Conference, there were eight targeting penalties of which two were called on MAC players. 
Three of those were ultimately overturned by replay. Last year when that occurred, the, eject the ejection was canceled, but the 15-yard penalty remained in place. This year, if replay overturns the penalty, there will no longer be a 15-yard penalty uh, um, marked off as long as there was not another penalty on the play, such as, such as a late hit or a hit out of bounds. A new rule being implemented this year, and it was also led uh, by an effort by the College Football Officiating Board of Managers, will focus on protecting the quarterback. When an offensive player um, in a passing posture with one or both feet on the ground, no defensive player can hit that player at the knee or below. Certainly there is no uh, player more exposed than a quarterback when he is passing. And so we're trying to take that play out of the game and it's very similar to a rule that the NFL also has. And this year also marks the beginning of, the, of uh, all the FBS conferences coming together to form the college football playoff. The public and the media and in fact, many coaches and many players have been clamoring for this for probably as long as the BCS has been in existence. And before we push aside the BCS for a second, I would reiterate that the BCS was very positive for the Mid-American Conference and for all of FBS football. It brought increased relevance and scrutiny to all of our games and all of our teams. And an unintended yet positive consequence of the BCS was an expansion of bowl opportunities, which has provided a chance for increased participation by American Conference teams. The college football playoff is a work in progress, and we will all watch as the selection committee goes about its business of conducting their rankings, ultimately selecting the teams that participate in the playoff, and the highest ranked uh, group of five champion to move on to a host bowl. We very much like the fact that the group of five has that, in essence, automatic bid to participate in either the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, or the Fiesta Bowl. It provides the most direct access that any of our conferences has ever had to a New Year's Day Bowl game. And quite frankly, I expect that to be at the, the, among the top of the, the priorities and goals for any of our teams. We expect to be in those games. To have five primary bowls lined up for the next cycle represents very solid growth for the conference. The games are in unique and interesting locations and all should provide great experiences for our student athletes and for our fans. Personally, I divide the season into three segments. There's a non-conference segment, there's a conference segment, and then there's a bowl segment. And for us to attain the goals we want to as a conference, we need to be successful in all three of those segments. I cannot agree more, or could not agree more, with that great baseball philosopher Yogi Berra when he said, the future ain't what it used to be. There continues to be change afoot in the world of intercollegiate athletics. The quotes of several leaders in higher education are right on the mark. The president at Harvard University said, quote, lofty gate receipts from college athletics have turned amateur contests into major commercial spectacles. The president at MIT said, quote, if the movement, meaning college athletics, shall continue at the same rate, it will soon be fairly a question of whether the letters BA stand for Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Athletics. Interestingly, those quotes are not from today, but from the early 1900s. Because while change is in the air, perhaps the issues surrounding intercollegiate athletics despite there being more revenue in the system and more media exposure and greater scrutiny from the public and the media, perhaps the issues really haven't changed at all since the early beginnings of intercollegiate athletics. A brief history lesson is in order. The NCAA was born out of the fear of governmental intervention into college sports, namely football. In the early 1900s, college football was in crisis due to the large number of deaths attributed to football. In 1905 alone, there were more than 18 deaths reported in college football. In December 1905, 68 schools attended a meeting in New York City, and from that was born the Intercollegiate Athletics Association, which in 1910 was renamed the National Collegiate Athletics Association. The NCAA was established out of the need to address and regulate the issues of that day, and quite frankly, still the issues today. 
namely the pressure to win, the commercialization of sport, and the need to have a governing body with regulations to ensure fairness and safety. It was during this period that the oversight of intercollegiate athletics moved from the students to the faculty. And now let's flash forward to the 1980s. And a poor economy had university presidents dealing with the dual pressures of severe budget constraints and the need to win. Presidents felt the need to become more engaged in the operation of the national organization, leading to the development of the NCAA President's Council, or excuse me, President's Commission in 1984. This was an early precursor of what today we call the NCAA Board of Directors. The key word of that time period was cost containment. Many of the rules and regulations that some are today claim, claiming are overly restrictive came from that time period. And it was the power schools enacting those rules and regulations to protect themselves from each other. I would, any of the media members who are out there or anyone else, do you remember back in the day when we would have hardbound 400 page full color media guides? That was one of the issues addressed at that time. 1984 is also noteworthy because that is when the Supreme Court put an end to the NCAA's control over the televising of collegiate football. In a suit led by the universities of Oklahoma and Georgia, the door was opened for unprecedented growth for television exposure and revenue. And then in the 1990s, the NCA and its member institutions moved to a representative conference-based governance, which included weighted voting and marked the end of one institution, one vote, and introduced the concept that market value and the value of the, or the weight of one's vote was linked partially to that. I kind of call it the gold standard. Those who had the gold made the standards. Um, that leads us to today where we are faced with another potential change in the governance of the NCAA. The third such change in the last 30 years after having the same system of governance for the first 75 years. The last three or four years have seen a large number of institutions moving from conference to conference. The MAC was the only FBS conference that neither added nor lost a full member institution during that period of time. Currently, it seems if, as if everyone is focused on new governance system, a number of lawsuits that have been filed, and quite frankly, uh, even an attempt to unionize football student athletes at one private institution. American historian Joan Wallach Scott said, quote, those who expect moments of change to be comfortable and free of conflict have not learned their history, unquote. Those words are true. The issue of governance is smack in front of us. The report of the NCAA Division I Steering Committee was released last Friday, and it is the result of more than a year of dialogue among the Division I membership, especially among directors of athletics, faculty athletics representatives, presidents, and commissioners. I fully expect the NCAA Board of Directors to approve the new governance model when it meets on August 7th, with full implementation to begin in January starting at the NCA convention. Clearly an area of legislative autonomy has been carved out for five conferences. This provides them with the ability to enact permissive legislation for all of Division I, focused primarily in the area of student athlete well-being. We are headed toward the redefinition of a grant and aid so that it may include the full cost of attendance. And while I am supportive of this, we will not support paying student athletes, which is inconsistent with the collegiate model. The football bowl subdivision, FBS, it remains intact. And in fact, the 10 FBS conferences work collaboratively in moving forward on this new governance structure. And in the end, no one got everything they wanted. That's probably a positive thing. I would encourage the membership, especially the group with the legislative autonomy, to focus on issues such as the number of hours student athletes devote to their sports. I am not sure we have done a very good job of enforcing the existing 20 hour rule. We should examine whether it is healthy for, for in the summertime to have our student athletes have a dead period where they get away from campus, whether it's to go take an internship or travel, go home, or just flat out get away from campus, get away from coaches, and do something else. 
And I would add one final thought to the issue of a new governance structure. In his final statement to the American public before he passed away, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I'm going to truncate his words a little bit, said that, quote, great authority involves great responsibility with the ability to enact specific legislative areas under the rubric of autonomy. The five higher resource conferences have a vast responsibility to preserve the collegiate model and do what is right for student athletes and what is right for higher education. We need to hold them to that. And finally, before I close, I would like to offer a few comments on the endeavor of intercollegiate athletics. From so many directions, people are challenging why we have higher education and sports linked. We in the United States and Canada are the only ones who combine those two. One of the great pleasures of my position is I get to visit with student athletes and their families on some occasion. And when I have had a chance to in particular visit with foreign student athletes who have experienced a different educational system and a different sports system, they almost always speak to how special it is to come to the United States pursue an education and develop their abilities in their chosen field while also pursuing their passion in sports. They comment on how they could not do that back home and how wonderful it is that they have the opportunity to combine those two. Perhaps we have it right. Intercollegiate athletics adds vibrancy and energy and fullness to our institutions. And this is not to say that there are not challenges. And that explains why there are so many checks and balances in the system. And when they are implemented, they help us to regulate those pressures. And when they are not, we often have challenges. The term student athlete has been derided by many. And I can assure you that those in the Mid-American Conference and positions of leadership have great respect for that term and take it very seriously. Pressure from the public from the legal system and perhaps even from the government are causing all involved to take a hard look at how we conduct our affairs. We have, we have lost the PR battle about the value of a grant and aid and the value of getting an education. And I find it amazing that some believe that receiving an athletics grant and aid is not a good deal. As the father of three in college, I wish my children were on grant and aids for, for, for being on a sports team. It is a great deal. Not to mention the fact that we failed to emph emphasize the $1.5 million difference. A person with a college education or a college degree will have an earnings power over someone who does not have a college degree. And we have failed to discuss the dollars available to student athletes through the NCA Student Athlete Opportunity Fund. In the end, we in the Mid-American Conference are confident that despite the changes that are to come, we will con continue to compete and earn our fair share of wins. And we will continue to recruit and develop young men and women who will go on to achieve wondrous things. Patriot and philosopher Thomas Paine wrote, quote, the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Our student athletes, our coaches and administrators are up to that challenge of this uncertain future. Thanks for being here, Ken. We can open it up to questions.